Hi class, today we're going to do another Applied Ethics, this one on diversity and discrimination. Um, first of all, it's a big issue and it's an important issue, and it's still in some ways a hot button issue. And related to that, it's a really hard issue. Um, everybody knows certain types of discrimination are bad. Everybody knows diversity uh, in certain ways and controls is good. Uh, but that's far too general. And when we're trying to shift to policy, things get a lot stickier. And so, you know, just think of if we're Rawlsians in the, uh, if we're trying to arrive at a just principle uh, in terms of diversity and hiring uh, in academia, which these two articles largely focus on academia, uh, even then, it's 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 tough, and it's something we have to work on and be very careful about. And so, uh, both of these articles are uh, a little older. You'll notice they're both from 1993, when uh, certain issues with affirmative action were really, really, really um, controversial, I suppose. Uh, but the controversy continues to this day. We just had. Uh, an affirmative action measure on California's ballot that was uh, voted down a lot of, to a lot of people's surprise, um, partially because of some of these problems that your authors raise. And so we're going to start with Lawrence Thomas. Um, his article entitled What Good Am I? Uh, is uh, from his perspective as an African American professor. Um, again, we know diversity in some way is good. In fact, there's quantifiable, measurable tests that show this kind of thing. Um, but we need to, we can't just leave it at that. Things are much more complicated. And so where does the value come from is the important question for Thomas. And he's going to start by rejecting these two just really bad, he thinks, uh, arguments. So the first of all is the so-called role model argument. Uh, that somehow we need uh, diverse people in academia to say we need women teachers to serve as role models to women, African-American teachers to serve as role models for African-Americans, etc. Um, he thinks this is bad in, in important senses because then the only thing a minority could teach you is how to be of that minority or how to not be a bigot. Um, but obviously there's a lot more value to be had than those types of things. And so he sets that one aside. And then he raises the second one that he calls the counterfactual argument from qualifications. Uh, why is it counterfactual? That's a logic term. Counterfactuals are, uh, roughly speaking, logic hypotheticals about worlds that don't exist. And so... The general argument, uh, the general counterfactual argument, is that um, affirmative action by forcing us to hire minorities is then implying that these minorities are less qualified than the people who would be hired otherwise. Um, that's the argument, and it's a very common argument, uh, but really... Uh, uh, Thomas has a really good point that that argument only works if we basically assume uh, that uh, the university, uh, that we're in a, in a sense a perfect world, that the university is only making these hires based on qualifications normally. And he says, well, that's not the world we live in. Um, it tells us nothing of this world because it ignores what he calls the buildup of biases. And we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. Uh, but start with his analogy of the starving people. That, well, uh, we, we have this kind of position of, well, uh, you know what, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this. This is on page 882. So, this argument has always struck me as extremely odd. In a morally perfect world, it is no doubt true that if women and minorities were the most qualified, they would be hired by virtue of their merits. But this truth tells me nothing 
about how things are in this world. It does not show that bias uh, does not show that biases built up over decades and centuries do not operate in favor of, say, white males over non-white males. It is as if one argued against feeding the starving simply on the grounds that in a morally perfect world it should not we should not have to. Uh, sorry, starvation would not exist. Perhaps it would not. But this is no argument against feeding the starving now. Uh, so, yes, in a perfect world, everyone gets hired based on best qualifications at the end. Having said that, that's not the world we live in. Instead, you're confusing the ideal with what people are suggesting to get to the ideal. Uh, and that's a pretty serious mistake. Uh, you know, in terms of the buildup of biases... Um, there's a fortunate sense to the timing of looking at these because uh, we've been seeing these kind of things a lot in the news. Uh, so to take a really simple uh, example of a, just a wealth bias, um, there used to be a policy in real estate called redlining that basically didn't allow uh, minorities certain types of housing loans. And you say, well, that was 60 years ago. Who cares? Well, because wealth transfers. Um, when my grandparents died, their house and the wealth that was associated with that house rolled over to that next generation. And when my parents die, hopefully a long, long, long time from now, that wealth will roll over into my and my siblings. And so uh, if you if you cut off avenues to housing and force people to rent um, 50, 80 years ago, that still has ramifications now. So that's a, that's a financial example. Um, but very similarly, you get uh, things like that in terms of the relationship. Uh, for instance, in the next article, Wolf Devine will talk about the relationship between wealth and number of BAs and advanced degrees, and therefore people who are employed in academic administration um, there's a lot uh, of built-up biases, and then, and that's just wealth biases. But now we start talking about psychological biases, uh, how someone reacts if a minority person is suspected of taking their phone versus uh, one where uh, it's not a minority. Uh, we've seen that lately. Even uh, there have been articles on how news describes purported criminals. Uh, and if it's a white male murderer, they use, oh, surprising, he was quiet and friendly to the neighbors and da-da-da-da-da. Uh, and they'll even use better pictures than, than if presenting minorities. So uh, I'm not saying this is universal by any stretch, but you don't need to look particularly hard if you're looking for bias buildup in the U.S. Uh, if you want, a good discussion topic would be to go dig up some more examples. Uh, get it out there. Uh, one of the things that some people just have trouble accepting in this country is the only way we could solve problems is by acknowledging they exist. And yes, it would be a great and helpful exercise in the discussion boards if you went out and found some of these biases and articles that talk about these biases and things, because they are out there uh, and they're very prevalent. So uh, there's that. Uh, but anyway, with 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 that kind of support, uh, again, Thomas is leaning on kind of implicit. It's not hard to find this stuff, so he doesn't give a million sources. Also, notice there's a lot of this article cut out. It was a much longer article. Uh, but that's the general idea. And I don't think he's saying anything, you know, world-shattering there. People are like, wow, there's anti-morality biases. Huh. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but now let's shift to the positive. He's... So he's rejected the role model argument. He's rejected the counter counterfactual argument about qualifications. So those are not ways that we that we should be saying uh, thinking about uh, affirmative action. And so let's move to the positives. And um, he has a really interesting take on this. He says, "Well, look, yes, teaching is conveying information, sure." But if all we did was lecture, man, I'd have my weekends free because I wouldn't have to grade, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a cutesy way of saying. Uh, the other really, one of the other really important jobs of a professor is what he calls intellectual affirmation. Uh, not just giving you the information, but saying, 
yes, you know that information. Yes, you are qualified. Yes, you have passed what I've set forward, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really important. Um, but to actually succeed in intellectual affirmation, it requires trust. Um, and, and, and that should be one of those things that you'd say, of course, uh, well, if you had no trust in my abilities as a philosopher, then me telling you you're doing philosophy well should mean nothing to you. Um, but racism, sexism, uh, any other type of bigotry you like to throw in there, ultimately undermine that trust. Uh, that if we have these hidden biases, if we have these built-up biases, as he calls them, uh, we uh, are not going to have that kind of right connection uh, where we get that intellectual affirmation uh, based on this relationship of trust. And uh, that's really something that diversity can provide. That is is the value of diversity in academia for Thomas. Now notice he's pretty careful with qualifiers. He keeps emphasizing some. Uh, well, of course, uh, many people are able to connect to professors who are not of their own minority uh, and not just their own kind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is quite a few will benefit. Um, so that's that's the first real, really big advantage of diversity that he emphasizes is this uh, working towards the relationship of trust to achieve this intellectual uh, affirmation. But he adds some more as well. Um, he'll just kind of, uh, he'll also point out that this intellectual affirmation leads to uh, gratitude. That is feeling grateful for being taught and affirmed uh, intellectually and things like that. And that's, of course, kind of a, a bridge builder in terms of uh, diversity, and it's a great thing to have. Uh, and then lastly, the, 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 these are all related, but, but the, the third distinct advantage, if we want to articulate them separately, is that part of justice in a society, part of having a just society, means seeing that justice. Uh, that Yay, I can say that I appreciate people for their abilities, uh, and I would respect someone equally if they were different than me, but without actually seeing it, that we lose something. And this is uh, part of an important point that I skipped a little earlier, is that he points out the reason change doesn't happen, and this is a really important point, there's a lot of good, good data on this, if you want to discuss this in the discussion board too, um, because I can have a sincere belief, bigotry is bad, and still be a bigot. <laughs> um, or, you know, to put it in its most extreme step, I'm uh, sorry, extreme way, um, belief doesn't correspond to action. I can say racism is bad and still act in a racist way, uh, implicitly or explicitly, etc. And so because we have that break, we can't just say the words, we need to see... Uh, these kind of bridges being built, etc. And so that's, in a quick nutshell, is the Thomas article. Again, lots of good stuff in there to write about. Uh, but for now, we're going to look at uh, the Wolf Divine. On uh, She's writing on proportional representation. So again, this is uh, part of the 1990s uh, affirmative action diversity hiring push was, well, if uh, X percent of the population is Y, then why don't we have X percent of the population in uh, employed in Y? Uh, so the general implication is people tried uh, with the quota method of affirmative action, and that was very controversial, and uh, Wolf Divine is going to tell us some of the reasons why. And so she is going to deny the inherent value of proportionality. So put another way, you could say you could say diversity is good, and not commit yourself to anything about proportional representation. Uh, first of all, notice that uh, Thomas and Wolf Divine aren't necessarily disagreeing here. Um, so they're they're talking about different facets. You shouldn't see them as several of our other pairs of articles where. 
uh, the two of them are having a substantive disagreement. So she is going to start in a very similar way. She's going to say, well, people say there's this inherent value to proportionality. Um, why? Because because people are trying to make laws that enforce it and saying that we should be having this, etc. And she says there's two kinds of arguments for that proportionality. Um, and she's, of course, going to find both of these arguments lacking. One is they take disproportionality to be evidence of discrimination. Well, if, if uh, fewer women are teaching in this field, that field must be discriminatory against women, uh, as an example. Um, but then the second type of argument is uh, that somehow proportionality is reflective of value and diversity. And so, of course, she's going to say we can have value without proportionality, and we're going to see how a little later. Um, but overall, if you think that, uh, so if we want to say that a lack of proportionality implies injustice, if we are going to try to say that, she, her point is, we would have to, to say that, we would have to, to somehow say we would expect proportionality in a just world. Um, and so if you ask what does a just world look like and there's reasons to think that we wouldn't see proportionality within fields, uh, then there's a clear, in, uh, then that's a clear indicator that the proportionality argument doesn't work. So let's start with a few reasons then that she says we should not expect proportionality. Uh, and some of these reasons are problematic and some in, a, in an important sense aren't. So she starts with one that uh, in a very important sense is just not a problem. That um, one thing that we get very clearly with a lot of types of minority, especially ethnic minorities, is that ethnicity defines community and then community defines value. That is, different communities value different things. So uh, just as a simple example, think of what we value in the U.S. seems to be uh, the highest value is people with business savvy. Uh, think of CEOs and things like that. Um, that's, if we're treating the whole U.S. as a community, that's what we value most. But of course, that's not what I value most, pretty obviously. I didn't pursue my business uh, degree. Sorry, I, I finished my business degree, but I didn't pursue a career in business. That's what I meant to say. Um, but more generally, just different communities value different uh, different skills. And um, uh, for instance, my spouse's uh, family's ethnicity places very, very, very high emphasis on teaching uh, as a valuable uh, skill set and something to be respected and desired in a way that um, most Americans don't think of how poorly we treat teachers and pay teachers. Uh, and so if we, uh, we should not expect every ethnicity to value uh, uh, teaching in academia in the same way as... Uh, the larger community or the community you're wearing, etc. cetera. Um, and that goes both ways, too. Uh, so she pointed out that if we were trying to do proportionality, we'd actually have to fire a bunch of people who are disproportionately uh, highly represented. Um, when, um, so she mentions uh, Judaism specifically, but in fact, that's just a community that very highly values certain types of jobs and are more likely to push people in that direction. So... Uh, think of your own views here as a minute, just as a way to really emphasize her point. Uh, what if you don't have them already, and one day you're thinking about having kids? Imagine what jobs you would be happy if your kid told you they were going to pursue, and which ones that you'd be sad. And and you you start to get the sense of what's going on here. Um, and your answers aren't going to be the same as my answers. So uh, that's. That's, that's kind of the, the neutral one. The, the, the sadder one, the, the one that's reflective of bad facts about the world, uh, is, of course, uh, poverty. <clears throat> so she mentioned the U.S. having the biggest poverty gap in the world in 1993. Uh, that problem has been getting worse every year since then. So 
That's not fun to think about. But that creates uh, notion, uh, notions of poverty create a separate type of issue. Or I should say separate type of reasons to, to not expect proportionality. Uh, it is an unfortunate fact that uh, the vast majority of the vast majority of minorities. Yep, that's what I mean to say. The vast majority of minorities uh, are uh, have less average wealth than the majorities. So, uh, more likely to be in poverty is the very very relevant fact here. Uh, but if you have grown up in a life of poverty and you are educating yourself and able to get out of that poverty in some way, that's going to influence uh, what decisions you make in terms of where your employment goes. Uh, and people who are coming out of poverty and extreme poverty, very unlikely to go into academia because uh, most academic fields, the pay is eh, for many, many years of school plus a pile of student loans. I mean, if you want to if you have ability and intelligence and you want to make money quickly, it's not academia. And so uh, the very fact that uh, certain types of minorities are more likely to come from poverty means they're less likely to go into academia, period. And so that's not reflective of a problem in academia. Of course, it's a reflective of a problem in society. And so we don't, we don't fix that problem at the university level. We fix it at the society level. So... Uh, proportionality of hiring is not the best university response to the problem of poverty. Uh, she suggested some other ways that, uh, some other methods the university might use that would be a lot more bang for the buck, so to speak. Uh, instead, and then at a societal level, what we should do is confront the wealth gap directly rather than say we could fix this all with affirmative action. Uh, get those people more education and get them in teaching jobs and this problem will miraculously go away. Um, so that's not helpful either. And so uh, getting the poor to the middle class gets to more BAs, getting more people into college is what gets more people into uh, academic careers. So uh, again, why is... Uh, why is Wolf Divine going through these points? Uh, it's not that she's trying to solve the poverty issue right now. It, it's the more general point that saying disproportionate representation is unjust only follows if in a just world uh, we would expect all to be proportionate. And these are just reasons we, don't, we shouldn't expect that. Um, so it is not... It is not discriminatory to acknowledge that uh, certain minority groups are uh, more likely to be in poverty. So says Wolf Divine. Um, notice that, that that particular issue doesn't apply as directly with women, and she points out um, not judging. She's very clear about not judging on this, um, but it's simply a fact about the world that uh, uh, women tend to be uh, spend more time with children which leads to more part-time employment, which is also going to skew the numbers further. So three different reasons we shouldn't expect proportionality in academia. Having said that, let's talk about the good type of diversity in her mind, which isn't proportionality, it's something else. Um, so she says, well, there, diversity is becoming a buzzword, uh, and of course still is. Uh, but... What, uh, in what way do we value diversity? And again, it's not checking boxes with numbers. That's not it because um, it's uh, things are much more complicated than that. That you know, assigning minorities in certain ways in the in the kind of box checking measure with measurable goals is a form of stereotyping. Uh, she gave an example uh, that well, you could have. Uh, two African-American professors who come from incredibly different backgrounds, say poverty in the South versus, um, you know, within an urban area. Um, 
And they could also, you could have different backgrounds in terms of grow up in poverty, grow up extremely wealthy. Uh, they're, they're, all of this stuff, uh, tons of different backgrounds give what she calls intellectual diversity. And yet, that that's the kind of diversity we want, but that's not reflected simply by skin tone or whether someone's Hispanic or not or whether someone's a woman or not, uh, etc. These are not uh, checking those boxes, uh, keeping measurable goals of diversity based on those type of minority groups just doesn't get the job done. Uh, and so she says for dialogue, what's important is intellectual diversity. That's what's good. But we have to be careful because limitless intellectual diversity <laughs> that, that undermines community, undermines communication, confuses the student. And so that's her general point is our goal is to kind of find the sweet spot of intellectual diversity. Um, and that's how we value diversity, not by proportionality numbers. So uh, if uh, a lot of good stuff in the Wolf Divine article too. So we could talk some more about, uh, you know, again, think from kind of a Rawlsian framework. Does intellectual diversity, is, is that what seems good? And if so, how do we achieve it? And what does it bring to the table, uh, especially in terms of uh, how to best achieve it use, uh, with the employable body? What should we look for? Uh, but we could also talk about you know, the two arguments she rejects as well. Uh, well, yes, we do. Uh, it, is, it is pretty obvious that uh, we shouldn't expect proportionality. But does it follow from that that proportionality is bad? So you could talk about our inference there uh, that uh, proportion, uh, sorry, she doesn't say proportionality is bad. She says uh, proportionality is not inherently good. Uh, and so given these extra, you know, thoughts about community and about poverty, uh, should we still be seeking proportionality? Is that a good, say, first step? Uh, to go back to the Thomas article, well, certainly not the ideal, but is this something we use to get towards the ideal is an interesting thing to think about. Um, and, well, is uh, responding uh, to, uh, is, is desiring diversity actually a, a good way or a bad way to work on uh, poverty of various minorities? It's, there's lots of interesting questions in here. Again, love to hear your thoughts on them, and we will talk to you next time.